So welcome everyone to our second uh, Maverick Diversity Institute session of fall 2020. Um, the Maverick Diversity Institute is here to offer challenging and unique workshops and programs that will help you become a diversity certified expert on inclusivity, access, and equity in our workplace and classroom environments. And um, I know some of you might be attending um, the multiple, of ses multiple sessions that we have of the Institute to get your certificate. And I'm going to post here uh, a link to the form, the sign-in form. So if you are here on behalf of the Diversity Institute to complete your certificate, please click on the link and fill out that form. Um, for us so we can track your attendance. Um, if you're not here for the Dorsey Institute um, and you're just here for fun and learn, welcome as well. Um, if you want to start working on the Dorsey Institute, please fill out the form so we can keep track of that. So um, that's just part of the program we offer every year each semester. And at the end of the semester, once you complete the sessions, um, you turn that in to us. We'll keep track of that. And um, it's just a way that you can use it as part of your professional development or um, building your resume, um, things like that. So we're super excited to have our session today. Um, and just know that we can all play a role in making Minnesota State University Mankato a welcoming and inclusive institution to work, learn, and grow at. And so that is um just a brief overview of our our program here and today's session is titled renaming sibley park history and information and i'm going to hand it over to our presenter for the day and you can just introduce yourself thank you very much megan um i also want to let everybody know if for some reason something technologically goes wrong please interrupt me and let me know immediately so that i don't just ramble on and on um my name is jamil huck I'm an assistant professor of history in the history department here at MSU. Uh, this is my second uh, presentation for the Maverick Diversity Institute uh, over the course of its, its and my career. And I, I am here more so as the director of the Kessel Peace. And I'll be talking more about that as I go on. So let me pull up my PowerPoint. And again, and just, I'm so glad to see everybody here. Uh, especially on, uh, I just want to acknowledge that this is an MEA day. So if you have kids, uh, there's a 50-50 chance my kids will make an appearance in this presentation. They're um, terrible children. Uh, I mean, they're, I'm sorry, they're wonderful children. And I'm sure they'll leave me alone for this presentation. But if they don't, I apologize in advance. Here we go. All right. Thank you, Megan, for inviting me to talk to everybody today. Thank you, everyone, for attending yet another Zoom meeting. I don't miss uh, most of the refreshments that are usually provided at MSU events, but uh, except for the chocolate chip cookies, those are pretty good. My name is Jamil Huck. I'm a professor of history here at Minnesota State University, Mankato. Since January, I'm also the director of the Kessel Peace Institute. The Kessel Peace Institute is housed within the school of SBS and has a mission to promote peace and social justice. The Kessel Peace Institute is named after Abbas Kessel. I just want to say a few words about the Institute and about Dr. Kessel in case you're not familiar with the Institute and with this wonderful individual. Dr. Kessel was a political science professor at Minnesota State University, Mankato for nearly 20 years. He was born in Tehran, Iran in 1918. While working for an Iranian firm tied to the American Armed Forces during World War II, Dr. Kessel saw and experienced the negative effects of war and developed a personal motivation to promote peace, nonviolence, and social justice. In 1946, Kessel began his studies in the United States at the University of California, Berkeley, becoming a United States citizen in 1964. Dr. Kessel came to teach here at MSU in 1966 uh, during the Vietnam War and helped defuse an anti-war demonstration that shut down Mankato and threatened to turn violent in 1973. It's actually a very uh, uh, important moment in the history of the anti-war movement uh, happens in Mankato, where you have two uh, well-known activists, Mitch Goodman and uh, Abbas Kessel, who have very different views. Uh, Mitch Goodman wanted people to throw uh, uh, cans of soup at people, and Dr. Kessel uh, wanted everybody to be peaceful. And here he is, in our old downtown, they tell me, though I've only been here six winters, that 
uh, the downtown doesn't look anything like it used to. When they built the new bridge, they changed some of the streets and buildings. So I can't exactly tell you where this is, except it looks like it might be somewhere down by the uh, post office area. Um, after Dr. Kessel died in 1987, his widow, Ruth Minor Kessel, carried on Abbas Kessel's legacy of peace and social justice through creating the Kessel Institute for the Study of Peace and Change in 1993. Since then, the Institute has had fantastic leadership from Donald Strasser, uh, Barbara Carson, Jackie Vaselli, and Carol Glasser. And now it survives despite my leadership. Uh, I just want to say one more thing as a history professor, particularly one who talks about global history and religions. Uh, Dr. Kessel comes from a tradition that's known as the Baha'i faith. If you're familiar with Unitarianism, which is, uh, we have a Unitarian church in Mankato, you know that Unitarianism arises out of uh, Christianity in Central Europe uh, uh, several hundred years ago. And the Baha'i faith, which is very similar to Unitarianism in its sense of embracing all religions as valid religions uh, and its commitment to peace and social justice, it emerges out of Islam in the uh, 18th century in Iran. So this is the tradition where Dr. Kessel was coming from. Now, why should we rename Sibley Park? The idea of renaming Sibley Park fix, fits within our local context of reconciliation in Mankato. This movement is within a larger national context of renaming buildings and removing statues. Renaming the park will help people, and especially the children that frequent the park locally and around the region know that we, as a town, have a commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion in our community. Furthermore, I believe it expands the definition of what it means to be a citizen of Mankato. If we truly want our children and all the children of Mankato to wake up in a world that values them, this is a small but necessary step in that direction. So the problem is, how do we create a Mankato where we privilege every citizen's voice and promote diversity, inclusion, and equity, and whose story is the Mankato story? Do we want our city to be narrative over all others? As pertains to Sibley Park, which is, I believe, the showcase of our city park system, I propose that we have a problem. We have a problem because Henry Hastings Sibley was instrumental Finally, he condemned over 300 people to death, all of whom were prisoners of war and promised fair treatment. The trials for this took place at Sibley Park, the delightful park full of baby goats and barn themed uh, playgrounds was the site of a mass prison where sham trials took place. Let's backtrack a little to talk about who Henry Hastings Sibley was. Here is his picture looking very heroic on a horse. And this is uh, direct from the official webpage at the Minnesota Historical Society that doesn't mention any of the events which I'll be talking about today. Now Sibley was born in Detroit and he came to Minnesota like most immigrants in pursuit of a job. It was as a fur trader in Minnesota that Sibley established a working relationship with the native indigenous Dakota peoples. Sibley later used these relationships to help negotiate a treaty with the Dakota people. Sibley misled Little Crow and other Dakota leaders about the content of the treaty. This is the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux. It should be noted that Sibley netted $66,000 personally from this treaty. This is in back payments to the fur company that Sibley personally profited from. Sibley netted $66,000. The Dakota tribes that signed the treaty only received $60,000. So Sibley personally profited more than the actual tribes. Uh, after leaving the fur trade, Sibley became a politician and eventually became the first governor of the Star of the North, Minnesota. His prominence in the state and his knowledge of the Dakota people led him to being picked as the colonel to prosecute the Dakota War. Historical records show that Sibley was referred to as Minnesota's undertaker because of his ability to show up after a battle. Therefore, he was not a particularly skilled military leader. He used the very starvation that drove the Dakota to desperation as his only real military tactic. This treaty shows, this uh, picture rather, shows the extent of the treaty that Sibley negotiated. Um, you'll see that the uh, area 
uh, the size of the land, size of the land ceded or given away, sold, is not the misleading aspect of the treaty. The misleading aspect of the treaty was the size of the payment from the United States government to the Dakota and how that money would be delivered. The Dakota believed that money would be delivered in cash. Much of the payment for the land the U.S. government decided unilaterally was to be given in food, which the Dakota were not made aware of. Uh, and a good deal of the money that they were given for this treaty was taken back to settle debts with the fur company, Sibley's company, which the Dakota were also not made aware of in the treaty signing. In 1862, it was the withholding of food promised by that treaty, by the United States government, that was the main cause of the war. So we know what we know, but if we know that Sibley's actions were wrong, why do we have a park name for Sibley? And why do so many people insist on not changing the name of the park? I launched this initiative several months ago and I have been surprised by how, many, how much pushback there is. Um, my opinion piece for the free press was rejected, um, no explanation, and uh, I've heard a lot of secondhand um, uh, 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 stories of people who have become aware of this movement, uh, that, which I must add is not a new movement. I'm, I am trying to be, to reinvigorate something that's been going on for years. And I also want to point out that Kessel is trying to be a leader but not the leader. So we are all, we are hoping to work with a broad coalition of people, uh, especially uh, the natives and in native indigenous peoples of the region to do this. And we are very actively listening to all the problems that people have with it. So there are a lot of people who are intent on not changing the name of the park. And secondly, why is there no monument or even a basic acknowledgement of these events in the park? I'm assuming everybody has been there. If you haven't, if you, uh, the park is divided loosely into two areas, separated by a mound which has a, a pergola on top. And uh, the area on the left has historic information. I think of it as a left, I guess it's the south. Has historic information. Uh, it does not mention this at all. Uh, any of the events we'll talk about today. So we return to the question, what should and what will Mankato be known for? We have to look to our past to determine what we want from our future. There are a few things that we already are known for outside of the region. Maud Hart Lovelace's Betsy Tacey series is, in my opinion, the single most positive thing that Mankato is known for nationally. If you don't know the series, it is a um, pro-immigrant feminist series written uh, about life here 100 years ago in Mankato. Uh, I may be biased, I'm a board member of the Betsy Tacey Society, but every summer weekend, tourists from over the country roam the Lincoln Park neighborhood in search of locations from the books. People take this very seriously and it's fantastic books. And these il illustrations by Lois Lenski, who is a very famous uh, children's book illustrator as well. Now, Mankato is also known for uh, around the country. My friends like to comment on my Facebook page about all the bizarre traffic accidents that take place in Mankato. Here we have a picture of that dog that crashed a truck into a gas station. Uh, that happened in Mankato. Uh, the accident uh, that led to hogs blocking Highway 169. And that time that guy tried to kill the Profinium building with his car. It was a New Year's Eve, I believe, a couple years ago. But sadly, uh, this is what we're mostly known for. While the hanging of the 38 happened downtown, much of the events leading up to it happened at Sibley Park. After the war wound down, when Sibley called upon the Dakota to surrender, many did. It should also be noted that most Dakota did not fight in the war. It was only a small portion that decided to take up arms. When the Dakota surrendered, the elderly, the women, and the children were force marched up to Fort Snelling and then exiled to South Dakota. Many, if not most of these non-combatants died during this reloc forced relocation, which is a definition of a genocide. This occurred directly due to the actions of Sibley, who promised them safety, not death and exile. The men 
whether they were combatants or non-combatants, were incarcerated as prisoners of war at Sibley Park. There they were tried without lawyers by a jury of militia that they had just fought against. Some trials lasted only minutes, mere minutes. 303 prisoners of war were condemned to death. Had Sibley had his way, all 303 prisoners of war would have been killed. We all know that individuals like Henry Whipple and Abraham Lincoln, thousands of miles away, intervened and dedicated substantial amounts of time, labor, and resources to reviewing the trial transcripts. Lincoln recommended that only two of the prisoners be executed. Sibley demanded more, hence the 38 prisoners of war who were hanged all together on December 26, 1862. I believe that renaming Sibley Park fits into the framework and context of Mankato's move towards reconciliation. These steps have been taken as a whole community, uh, both with the indigenous Mankatoans and the immigrants of all periods. The powwow, changing the Mankato state mascot, Reconciliation Park. You're all probably aware of these and maybe some of you have helped in these initiatives. Renaming Sibley Park is another step towards reconciliation. Now I hear your objections already, community of Mankato. And objection number one is you are erasing history. Oh, that's, that's quite a thing for, to claim that a historian is doing. Since I announced this initiative earlier this summer, two main objections have been raised. I wanna, add, I wanna say that we are not erasing history. I'm an expert, trust me. As a historian, I literally write history and I teach it. My students know that history is never a full or even accurate picture of the past, but a nuanced story told for multiple purposes. Now, if you really looked at world history books, you would think that 99% of all the world's history population in all of history was, were male and were white. And that's obviously not true. History is a conglomeration of the stories a society tells itself to reveal what it prioritizes in the past and how it wants to move into the future. What should our history be? It's our town, our time, and we get to determine what our history focuses on. The history that I learned growing up, and I suspect many of you learned growing up, was the history of white male achievement and white male ethnic triumph over brown, black, and indigenous peoples. Think about how Tenzing Norgay, a South Asian man, carried all the equipment up Mount Everest, but it's Edmund Hillary who gets all the credit. Or Magellan, uh, despite not actually achieving his goal of circumnavigating the world, gets credit for it and gets credited as the first human being to sail around the world. He didn't. Um, he didn't even do it. On his journey, it was an enslaved person known to history only as Enrique, who, when realizing he was back on the island in Indonesia or the Philippines that the Portuguese slavers had kidnapped and enslaved him on, successfully ran away. And dear to the hearts of the American narrative of the Midwest, the journeys of Lewis and Clark, they could not have done it without York, the enslaved person that carried all of their things for them. History is biased and inaccurate. It represents the bias of the historian and their society and the vision of what the time and place values. History is a mirror of what we value now, not what people valued in the past. What do we in 2020 in Mankato value? Do we value Sibley's role as the mediocre first governor of Minnesota over his nefarious role in the Dakota War? What do we value? Now to change gears just a little bit, I wanna give you a quick history of history. As a historian, it's hard for me to stop talking, especially hard for me not to talk about history. If you recall from the Harry Potter books, the history professor, Professor Binns, was so amused by his own boring lectures that he didn't even notice that he died and continued, just continued lecturing as a ghost. My research uh, as a historian involves the creation of history, particularly that of the creation of the Western civilization narrative. Western history. This is, a, this is a picture of James Harvey Robinson. He was a professor at Columbia University uh, from about 1900 to 1920. And Robinson basically created the narrative of Western civilization and with it our own historical narrative. Before Robinson, history in the United States was mostly seen as something that came from the Bible. It was not the story of progress. It was not the story of civilization. You probably 
actually have in your mind backgrounded the Western Civ narrative that this man invented. That civilization Mesopotamia and Egypt, it spreads to Greece, Socrates says a bunch of stuff, then it's absorbed and improved on by Rome. Rome gets crushed by barbarians and we have a dark ages. Nothing really happens until the Renaissance, which rediscovers Rome and Greece via the scholarly, scholarly work of Muslims. Then the Protestant Reformation happens, which leads to the Enlightenment, and that leads to modernity. When the United States was founded in 1776, none of the founders of our nation would have had this story in their mind, and they would not have thought of history the way we do. History changes. History is malleable and in its story. The history we have been taught is the triumph of Western civilization over everyone else. Being Christian, being male, and being from Western and Northern Europe. Think about this implication. History is the triumph of white men over everybody else. Even though we, as modern historians, have challenged aspects of Robinson's invented history, we still teach the basic outlines of it. Here at MSU, the faculty of the history department, led by Johannes Postma and Bill Lass, changed the Western Civ course into the world history course that I teach today. This happened in 1979. We have fantastic archives in our... They need the company over there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when Dr. Lass and Dr. Postma changed the class name, they didn't change the actual content of the course. Instead, people have been basically teaching the Western Civ, but they erased the title, and I just call it World Civilizations. So what has happened is that all of our diversity and inclusion, uh, uh, in my research, I refer to the old Western civilization narrative as the trunk of history. Think of a big, beautiful oak tree. What has happened is that all of our diversity and inclusion of non-Western history is just grafting limbs onto that original trunk, a process which I call appropriately grafting. The ultimate point I'm trying to make here is that modern history reproduces the original assumption that the West is the best and the West is white, Christian, and male. At least history is. So we have to ask, whose story do we honor when we name a park after Sibley? Why do we uphold the supremacy of whiteness? We come to objection number two. Um, when I was a kid, and I've heard people say this, when I was a kid, I went to Sibley Park. If you change the name of that park, it's gonna ruin my memories. Also, get off my lawn, kids these days, grumble, grumble, grumble. Um, but seriously, this actually is, is an objection I've heard from people of all uh, uh, generations. I'm not trying to be ageist, I apologize. This objection is uh, interesting, but I want people to rethink how they think about this objection. Here's the park I went to when I was a kid. I grew up in uh, near New York City on Long Island, New York, and I could walk to this little park, which is very similar in size to Sibley Park. You probably don't never heard of Christopher Morley, but Christopher Morley was an early 20th century writer. He was sort of a blend of Ernest Hemingway and Henry David Thoreau. He was a novelist whose most famous work, Kitty Foyle, was turned into a series on NBC in 1958. Uh, uh, Morley even had a little cabin that he built for himself. And uh, Sibley Park. I used to go to this park to play basketball, to swim, to hike in the woods, so on. Many of my fondest memories uh, uh, were made in that park. However, if you told me that Christopher Morley served in World War I, which would be appropriate to his lifespan, uh, and Sergeant York style captured uh, 132 German prisoners of war, marched them over to Long Island to this park, put them on trial, and then condemned them to die here, I would want to rename that park. And I would rather say, this is the park I went to as a child. As an adult, I realized the problem of that name, which I helped change. Now I bring my kids to Jamil Huck Park and tell them that I helped rename it. I believe that 
when the basic historic truth of what happened at Sibley Park is presented to people, everyone would be in favor of this name change. Uh, as part of that, what I have been doing is giving this presentation or similar presentations uh, to any group that will have me. I've given it to the Rotary Club here in Mankato. I've given it to Kiwanis in Mankato. I'm giving it to the Vine on the smartest people in Mankato. Um, because uh, people don't have access to the information. This information, though, uh, I, I leaned very heavily on, on John Bewin and uh, Gwen Westerman's work uh, on This American Life, uh, an episode called Little War on the Prairie. It's really everything you need to know in one hour about what happened at Sibley Park. Uh, but there's also fa other fantastic sources out there that I, I've uh, compiled that I'll show you a slide later. Um, renaming Sibley Park will give primacy to the spiritual the golden rule. It is the just and righteous thing to do. Uh, due to the extraordinary and heinous actions of Sibley, we should not have a park named after him. This is even more true because many of the historical crimes that Sibley is tied to occurred actually in the confines of the very park we named after him. While today it is all barnyard themed playgrounds and baby goats, in the past this was Sibley's prison camp where he held trials that dispensed only injustice. History is not and never has been a truly accurate picture of the past. It is instead the way we view our past in order to inform our future. I want to live in a Mankato that is welcoming, not only to white people, but to all people that wants to be in Mankato. I want Mankato to be what America promises to be. We cannot make our country live up to the promise, promises that it makes, but we can live up to the ideals of a pluralist welcoming society that does not privilege white imperialism over all other stories. Uh, next steps, your feedback, help, anything that uh, uh, I'm always very interested. I wanted to keep this presentation short, uh, in part because of how exhausted everybody must be of screen time, but also to hear what everybody has to say. So I've listed a couple of uh, resources. Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility is uh, the very sort of social justice teaching that has been banned by the federal government. So you have a delightful uh, uh, thrill of reading uh, about and pedagogy. And then Mary Wingard's North Country uh, is a comprehensive book. Mary Wingard is a professor, I believe, at St. Cloud. And of course, that little war on the prairie, which you can listen to uh, on your podcasts. So I'm going to leave this up here for a minute. And then uh, I'm going to stop sharing screens. All right. We did have one question that came out in the chat as you were presenting. And the question was um, from Greg, has this been taken to the city of Mankito during their open council meeting yet? Hi, Greg. No, um, it has not been. I have been sort of um, hoping to really get this out into the community and to gather information to start talking to people about it. I was hoping to take it to the council, but I decided that um, there the council after the election. It also was not clear to me, and it's still not entirely clear to me, whether the council is the only mechanism for solving this, whether there is uh, other, there are other ways to rename a park without engaging the city council. Um, I would, I would actually love to see this as something of a plebiscite where people get a chance, everybody in Mankato would actually get a chance to, to talk about this and have a chance to vote. But it does appear to me that the city council may be the only way to do this. But thank you for that question. Um, it has, I suppose, been shared with progressive faith-based organizations via my work so far with Rotary and um, Kiwanis, although neither of those obviously are faith-based faith organizations, uh, it's become pretty well known throughout town. 
and uh, we've been uh, working pretty hard to uh, get the message out there. So I actually, that's a really, I should bring, I should be, I will probably specifically contact the Unitarians, uh, the ECLA, and uh, a variety of other uh, progressive uh, faith-based organizations. That's a great idea. Um, it looks like Maria, ha you have your hand raised as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks so much, Jamil. This is uh, really amazing work that you're doing. And um, you know that I've been supportive of it from the start. Um, I was in an unfortunate um, Facebook comment thread uh, that I think was generally about um, taking down monuments and, you know, which I sort of see this effort as aligned with in some ways. Um, and somebody made the slippery slope uh, argument, which was something like, well, next thing you know, they're going to want to rename it they, you know, like this ominous group, I don't know, Antifa or whoever it is that you represent and I represent. Um, we're going uh, to want to rename Turtle Lot Park. And, and I was like, well, I, I don't know anything nefarious about Turtle Lot. I, you know, I know very little about him, but I, I don't think he has this, uh, this um, horrible uh, history of war crimes like Sibley did. Um, and so I guess I'm just thinking like, how do you, you know, as I talk about this with people I have contact with, um, what do you recommend or do you, have you thought through like those slippery slope arguments? Like we're not gonna be able to call it Minnesota anymore or, you know, we're gonna rename everything even if it's um, not so horrible. Um, so I'll just go to mute now. Thank you, Maria. No, I, I've hired, um, you know, I, there, when I did send in my article to the free press, I have my own thoughts on why they didn't publish it. Uh, but I did get interviewed by one of the free press reporters. So this did make the free press. And I uh, engaged with a lot of people on the Facebook uh, thread about that article. And people were yeah, uh, making that sort of argument. I think that that argument carries very little weight um, for most people. That it's just sort of a, uh, that's, it's, it's a real red herring argument. I, the arguments that people really seem to take to heart is not, isn't the slippery slope one. It's more of that, why are you changing history? Because it's the same question, right? If we have issues with, uh, you know, if, if we feel like in our modern period that we don't like keeping people enslaved, and we want to change things that are named after slaveholders in America, that is a very big assault on this Western Civ narrative that says people like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington are fantastic human beings, right? Um, so when I, you know, when we look at this idea of changing history, people have this impression that history fell out of the sky, just like the, uh, the rune stones over in Kensington, Minnesota that said Vikings were here. They just literally fell out of the sky. Uh, but history is not, that's not what history is. History is a reflection of the past uh, uh, through the eyes of the present. So you will find, I would almost 100% guarantee that the people who are opposed to renaming Sibley Park would also be opposed to things like Black Lives Matter or uh, um, any sort of politi uh, progressive political attitudes. And that's not something that in our time period right now that anybody can be argued out of. People have their, their beliefs, like their political beliefs, like their religious beliefs, and they're reactionary to the point where they'll, uh, 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 they will be angry about it, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to let everything settle down until after this election before I really start to push to do this. Right now it's information and, and action, information gathering and action uh, plan uh, contemplating. So I think that that slippery slope argument fits within the changing history argument. And then when people really think about, well, why is history like this? Then hopefully we can change their minds. Um, and uh, we've gotten, oh, sorry. We've gotten we've got quite a lot of questions. questions. Yeah, we've got a lot of questions. I also would just like to invite, it sounds like um, Megan Schnitker is here um, as well. So um, she just wanted to quick say a few words. And if you just Absolutely. want to introduce yourself, Megan. Hey, um, I'm Megan Schiffer of Mankato, and I apologize for joining late. 
Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure if you guys already covered this, but I was a part of the original um, uh, email chain that was going on a few a uh, couple months ago. Um, and what we talked about last year with the Indigenous Peoples Day Committee, because this question was brought up after the protest during Dakota 38, um, that the Blue Earth Historical Society had found some documents saying that they're not sure who Sibley Park is named after because there was a postman, uh, there was a, a family farm, and there was the fur trader, and then there was, of course, the, the, the general. And so there was no proof or documentation of minutes by the, the city council actually officially naming the city park. Um, and that was all done by the um, research done through the Historical Society. Um, and so that's a little bit that I know of as far as like the actual name of it. But I do know uh, that, you know, there, there is an older name that goes for that area because it was um, from what I have found is that it, it was a ceremonial area for Dakota people um, just because of the landscape of it. And then I do know uh, that uh, Glenn Wasichina has mentioned to numerous people uh, that he would like the park named after him, uh, his, his traditional Dakota name. And so those are the few things that I am aware of um, that have kind of been, been plopped on me. And so I thought I would um, brain vomit on you guys for a little bit about what I know. <laughs> and try, attempt to add to the conversation. So, um, and Megan, I, and can you just introduce to um, what other things you've been involved in in the community here? Yeah, sure. Um, I am chair of the Indigenous Peoples Day Committee. I am vice chair of the uh, Mayankero Wachipi Committee. Um, I am on the board for the Twin Rivers Arts Council. I am on the board for the YWCA. I am uh, ch vice chair of the River Valley Makers. And I believe those are all the committees I'm on. <laughs> I also own a, a business called Lakota Made here in town, and I have a nonprofit working on a cultural arts and education center here in Mankato uh, called Makato Revitalization Project. And so um, a lot of the cultural awareness, cultural education uh, programming that I do is through my nonprofit. And so um, I kind of get... Um, Lovingly, I get lo love to get this kind of stuff thrown at me because I like to be involved. Um, but that's just a little bit about what I do. I do have four kids, and I'm I'm being told that I need to tell everyone I'm running for school board. But that you know, um. <laughs> I was going to tell them if you weren't going to tell them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, we have uh, we have several fantastic, many fantastic candidates for school board. Two of them are here today, Megan and. Uh, Kenneth Reed, and uh, they're both fantastic choices for you to make. Uh, thank you so much, Megan, for coming. Um, I think the, 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 the Sibley as fur trader and Sibley as general being different people is a, is a BS argument. Uh, they're the same person. Um, the, from what I know, this was actually the, 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 it was a different, from what I've heard, and I, I County History Society and see what Jessica, was that specifically Jessica Potter or that was somebody else? I think that was Shelly at the Blue Earth Historical yeah. Society, Society that did right. that. Um, I, it was her and then there was, a, she had someone else that was, uh, that worked there before Shelly joined and I want to say her name was Beth um, and she did a lot of the research. So I'm forgetting right. her last name. I think we can, I also know there's uh, one of our graduates of Emmett from our history program, Heather Heron works there as well. I can be in touch with her to try to clarify some of this information. I had thought that that land belonged to, uh, belonged to, was owned by, at some point, a, gosh, what's the name of the family? It's not, hmm, there, so some of the other things that have happened there that we could talk about as, as being uh, uh, names for the park, because I see that's another question. Um, in the Bessie Tasty books, it's called Page Park. Um, Tib, who was, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the best character in the Betsy Tacy books, her ashes were spread there. Um, so there's this association to uh, Betsy Tacy. Thanks for the spoiler alert there, Jamil. <laughs> was, oh, sorry. Well, come on. And uh, I would like to see it have I think that the park could have multiple names. It has to have some sort of a Dakota name. 
Um, it, it could have multiple names though. And I think this is something that would be a really interesting community discussion. So I, the first thing I wanna do is not to say, we're gonna rename the park this, uh, we're gonna rename the park and then say, well, what should we rename it, right? And then have, uh, figure out a way to do that as a community to come together and to talk about We could give it as many names as, as we want, as far as I'm concerned. Where as far as I know, this would cost something like $5,000 because there's, I can only see there's two signs, right? There's that really junky sign over by all the silos and the uh, CHS buildings. And there's the sign, the big sign. And that's far, I mean, it's re renaming it, not like you uh, have to do any other changes. Uh, Google will catch up otherwise, and we'll figure that out. But I think it's an awesome idea to get the community involved, but also to give like actual history or history told um, to to the what the park is. It's like nobody really knows who the park is named after, and then be able to educate what we used to use the park for, and then here's you know different educational pieces. That's that's my goal of the whole thing is to kind of teach, get everyone involved in learning the actual history of the Mankato area. Yeah, and I think as part of that, not only, maybe even more, well, equally important to renaming the park is having some sort of monument uh, and plaques in the park that talk about these things. Are there any other questions or thoughts that people would like to share yet? Okay, well, seeing none, um, we can go ahead and conclude our session today. I appreciate you all being here. Um, I am going to, again, post the sign-in sheet. If you would like um, any follow-up information or if you are here attending for the Maverick Diversity Institute, please be sure to sign fill out that sign-in sheet um, for that. Um, if you would like to stay connected to these efforts, um, please feel free to either um, I think you also had um, uh, an email address, um, peace at mnsu.edu. Um, right. And so if you would like to get connected, please, yep, please feel free to shoot uh, an email there and um, stay connected to what is happening. So um, thank you all again for being a part of this conversation. I think we had a really great um, discussion and, um, you know, learned a lot. And um, thank you again for being here, everyone.